Before I start, huge shout out to my patrons because I purchased these speakers with Patreon funds. And I also purchased about $1,200 worth of speakers a couple weeks ago with funds from Patreon. So shout out to all my patrons. Let's go. Let's talk about Emotiva's new B2 Plus bookshelf speaker. Overall impression of the speaker, I'll just go ahead and tell you right now, if I'm being honest, I was a little bit disappointed. And I think some of that is because I had high hopes for the B2 Plus. The B1 Plus to me is probably one of the best, if not currently the best, budget-minded bookshelf speaker that I have personally come across. And when I saw that they were releasing a B2 Plus, I just kind of thought it would be a B1 Plus on steroids, which in some regards, I guess it really is. But what I mean by that is the B1 Plus was not quite linear, but it was good enough for its price. This speaker costing another $200 per pair. I was hoping that it would be maybe a little bit more linear, but just have a little bit more output given that it has a larger midwoofer. Unfortunately, it's not more linear. I'd say it's about the same. I would say that initial impressions were not pretty good or not pretty bad. They were kind of decent, I guess, kind of like right in the middle. The crossover network on the speaker leaves a little bit to be desired. And the radiation pattern of the midwoofer is narrowing up quite a bit as it reaches that two kilohertz region. And the tweeter comes in full omni. So as you hand off from the midwoofer to the tweeter, you are narrowing the radiation, which means you're sending out less information in the room. Then when you hand over to the tweeter, ooh, now you're sending a lot of information out to the room. You're getting a lot more energy off the side walls and off the wall behind you, off the ceiling, off the floor. And that basically means that you're gonna have more energy in the treble region throughout. And it's not like it's just one or two areas. It's it's pretty much throughout, you know, so it starts around two kilohertz and the high frequency bumps up and it stays about plus three dB or so above the mid range. And that is certainly noticeable. Now you may be a person who thinks that you would like that. I'll just tell you right now that I'm not. I prefer a speaker that is more neutral. However, this speaker doesn't exhibit the V curve that some speakers exhibit, which are just terrible and painful to my ears. This speaker is a, is a good step in the neutral direction, but that high frequency bump, that high frequency shelf is to me just too much. When I was listening to Dire Straits, the one thing I continually noticed was that electric guitar just seemed too strong, too stringent, uh, too grainy, just all these harsh sounds that I just didn't like. And it wasn't like it came out smacked you upside the head, but it was there and it was evident. My guess in my notes was that it was around four kilohertz. And then I also noticed some sibilance and I put in my notes around eight kilohertz. Maybe there's something going on. Then when I went and looked at the data, I saw, yes, there is a bump at around four kilohertz, but there's not a bump around eight kilohertz. Actually, what happens is you start getting another bump, maybe a breakup mode, could be diffraction. I'm not sure, but you start getting an issue around 10 kilohertz or so. Now that could lead to some of these sibilance that I was hearing, maybe a little bit carryover from that. But to be honest, I'm not 100% sure what that was. I could just tell you that. I was not really a fan of that particular sound. But with the four kilohertz area, definitely backed up in my data. As I said, you have a narrow radiation pattern in the midwoofer region. And then as you mate to the tweeter, all of a sudden everything's wide again. The other thing that I kind of noticed in my listening was that the upper mid bass sounded a little bit weak compared to the mid range. And it wasn't, wasn't terribly noticeable, but there were times where I thought, you know, it just sounds a little bit thin in that area. Sure enough, I go and look at my data. What I see is a baffle step issue around 500 hertz. It's kind of like if somebody took your voice and they said, all right, at 500 hertz, we're gonna make your lower mid-range sound a little bit softer than your upper part of your mid-range. You would notice that sort of thing. Now, it may not be very apparent, but if you listen A, B back and forth, you would certainly notice that. Now going back to the high frequency, when I towed the speakers off axis, that reduced the treble a little bit. and it made it more listenable. So what I would recommend is that if you're listening to these speakers, seriously consider listening to them off axis, pointing away from you and not directly at you, or use the grill. In my experience, the grill helped a little bit above 10 kilohertz, kind of knock down some of the air, which you know you may not like, but to me, it also knocked down some of that harshness that I was hearing. So there's a trade-off there, depending on what you wanna go after. As far as bass output goes, 
there's plenty of that, I think, for these speakers. And certainly if you want to use them with subwoofer, that'll make things a little bit easier on you. But in the upper mid-range, I noticed some glare, some grit to the mid-range sounds, the vocals. And it just didn't sound right. And my guess was that I was running into some kind of multi-tone distortion, you know, where you have multiple sounds playing at the same time. They start to overlap. And then you start getting distortion that just brings a unclear sound to the speaker. And I see that in the data, and we're going to talk about that shortly. I mentioned the baffle step. I don't want to forget to mention that putting the speaker close to a wall would theoretically improve that baffle step region. It would move the bass from about 300 hertz and below. It would boost that a little bit more. So it would flatten that out to make it match the upper mid range. Unfortunately, between about 300 hertz and 500 hertz, you're not going to get that match. Why? Well, because the speaker is radiating omnidirectionally, which means it's radiating in all directions, all the way around the speaker to about 300 hertz. And then at about 300 hertz, it starts to become more forward firing, means less energy is firing off to the back, less energy off to the side. So by the time you get to 500 hertz, you're pretty much all forward firing. There's no energy that's going to hit that back wall and be reinforced by that back wall, which means that that baffle step region can't be fixed by putting the speaker close to wall. If that baffle step issue was around 300 hertz, then you could probably fix it by putting it closer to a wall. But then all things being relative, that would probably also mean that you're going to have a different sized enclosure or drivers and then things change. But when you look at the data, kind of keep that in mind. If you do decide to put it near a wall to kind of increase, I guess, that lower mid range area, just understand that you're going to have a little bit of a dip around 300 hertz to 500 hertz due again to that baffle step discontinuity where the sound is not quite omnidirectional. It's more forward firing at that point. So now we're going to step through some of the data, which I measured using my Clipple near fill scanner. You can see this sucker in action. It's in my garage and this allows me to get full anechoic data, which then allows me to dissect the performance of the speaker before it goes in anybody's room. And that helps us understand the pros and cons of a speaker on an objective basis, rather than me just saying, I think I heard this thing, or you have to trust my hearing with my environment because everybody says everybody's rooms are different. But when you have data, you have a common ground to understand from, and you can use this to compare against other speakers that I reviewed that you may or may not like and find some areas in the data that gives you an idea of if you'll like the speaker or if you won't. In my case, what I found was that if you line yourself at the top of the tweeter, then the sound is too bright. But if you go just a little bit below the tweeter, you fill in that mid range area and the crossover region. So it's, it's pretty tight. I'd say it's about plus or minus 10 degrees within that tweeter window. And if you go below the tweeter by about 10 degrees, basically aiming your eyes with the bottom, or I should say with the top of the midwoofer, that's, that's the best place to be. But I don't think anybody's going to have that kind of razor precision as far as aiming goes. But it's good to know that information ahead of time because it actually does make a difference and it's a noticeable audible difference. What we have here is the CEA 2034 data. And this was measured again at the woofer, at the top of the woofer. Some highlights of the speaker are that it is 86 dB on average sensitivity. There is this baffle step issue that I talked about at around 500 Hertz. The F3 and the F10 is 66 and 43 Hertz respectively, which means that this speaker won't dig into the lows that well in your room. I mean, you might get down to 50 Hertz, but that's really gonna be pushing it. You're still gonna need a subwoofer for the speaker if you want any kind of good kick bass, kick drum punch out of the speakers. Having said that, the mid bass punch in the 120 Hertz area that gives you those harmonics of the kick drums, that was nice. I, I did enjoy that. But if you want low bass, if you want medium bass below like 60 Hertz, you're still gonna want a subwoofer with this speaker. The early reflections directivity index down here shows that it is linear up into about two kilohertz, which is where the crossover region is. And then we go more omnidirectional with the tweeter. So the tweeter comes into play and then we've got a discontinuity here. And this is a sign that you're gonna have trouble equalizing the response through here. So pay attention to that. We'll be back around in a second. This is the estimated in-room response, which is a good prediction for how you're gonna hear the speaker when you set it up in your room, unless you just have a really unique room. This is the trend line of the response. And as you can see, you've got two things going on here. You've got one is this baffle step drop. The other is the increased output into high frequency. So this, this speaker is going to sound bright. It's going to sound forward. It's definitely not going to sound warm and it may sound edgy or harsh, depending on how you describe an elevated high frequency response. Now to me, what I heard when I listened 
And this particular area is hi-hats, symbols, riding symbols, crash symbols. They all sounded extra detailed, extra airy, things like that. But after a few minutes, you're like, ah, that's, that's not right. And if you go reference back to something that's more neutral, you quickly understand where this kind of gives you a false impression of detail. Now let's talk about the radiation pattern. Remember I said the response narrows up through the midwoofer and then gets really wide at the tweeter? Well, we can see that. So I've drawn some black lines. This is the midwoofer area and you can see the response is radiating at about, oh, uh, I don't know, what is that? Almost plus or minus 90 degrees out through here and then it's shrinking up to it gets to about where it's about plus or minus 50 degrees down here at about two kilohertz. Well, here comes the tweeter. Boom, tweeter gets really wide, goes out to plus or minus 80 degrees, and then it starts to narrow up. And that is why there was so much energy in the high frequency area, because there's less energy being sent out to the saw walls through the mid range as it starts to tighten up in focus. And then there's a ton of energy sent out to the room by the tweeter in this area right through here. So from two kilohertz and on, this tweeter is really broad up until about maybe, what, 10 kilohertz or so, and then it starts to narrow up even more. That's why aiming will be crucial to figure out what works best for you in your room. And I would even advise you to consider using proper absorption on the sidewalls to help attenuate some of this to make it more neutral, and also the front wall to help capture some of that as well. Now let's talk about the vertical response. The vertical response is a pretty narrow window of about plus or minus 10 degrees. So you really wanna sit right within that tweeter region. And I would honestly say that the best spot is gonna be right at the top of that midwoofer up to the tweeter region and to the middle of the cone of the midwoofer. That's gonna be your window for success. And anything beyond that, you're gonna have issues in that crossover region where stuff isn't gonna sound quite right. Ideally, a speaker isn't that. In terms of distortion, this is 86 dB at one meter. Everything looks pretty good through here, although I am seeing a second order distortion right through this region. And then now at 96 dB, you are just barely touching, not even quite touching the 3% THD mark. And again, you can see that overall, what we're getting really is just a rising increase in distortion. Now, I don't know what's causing that. I am actually very, very curious, but the fact that it occurs somewhere near that baffle step region also makes me wonder if this is an influence of any kind of components. I don't know, that may be a bridge too far. Maybe it's some kind of internal resonance or something like that too. So that would take me really dissecting the speaker to try to figure that out. No, I don't think I wanna do that. This is the compression. And I would say that overall, the compression for this speaker is pretty good at typical volume. But when you hit that 102 dB compression, we can see things to get out of hand quick. And that little ribbon tweeter, is really having a hard time keeping up. So now we've got the multi-tone distortion test, which is done to simulate music. And what I've found in my own auditioning is that anything above about 20 dB or negative 20 dB is definitely gonna be audible. So I would say that this region right through here is gonna be audible, but this is at 96 dB for one speaker, a speaker by itself, not in a room. So if you took this speaker and then gave it another speaker and then put it in a room four meters away, uh, you're looking at somewhere around 86 dB or so, which I think is reasonable in terms of output, but I do this extra output testing to help you understand just what kind of distortion you're gonna run into and the capability of the speaker, because really that's what starts separating poorer performers from really good performers is that distortion and compression. And unfortunately we see some typical distortion and compression artifacts in this driver, which really just means that it's only going to get so loud. I would say that probably about 90 dB for a pair in your room is probably going to be pushing it before you start hearing audible distortion artifacts. Now, one thing I did was I tested the speaker at the tweeter, and this is what we have here. If you go back and compare to the original that I provided earlier, where the microphone was placed just at the top of the midwoofer, you'll see that that response is a little bit more smooth through here. It's not a lot, but it's, it's enough to notice it. But then I also took this and I applied equalization to it and then re-measured the speaker. And now we can see we have a much more flat on-axis response and it really fixed a lot of things for me. But notice we've still got this discontinuity down here. Now that's because you cannot fix radiation directivity with equalization. Everything's relative at that point. The only way you can fix that is by going in and changing the actual crossover itself. Bottom line, I'm saying all these things about the speaker. I think overall, I'm okay recommending it. Would I own it myself? I don't think so without EQ. With EQ, it's an easier sell to me, but that 4K area to me is, is still a problem. The data shows an objectively pretty good speaker. What I heard was a subjectively pretty good speaker. Now I'm not over the moon for this speaker. And I think 
Others probably are going to be. So you're just kind of getting my take. Fortunately, I have data to kind of back up what I'm hearing. And I always listen to speakers before I measure them because I don't want to get clouded by having seen the data. I've been doing this for long enough that I can pretty much trust my ears and trust that if I say it's in this frequency region, I'm going to be pretty dang close. And this speaker yet again just shows me that, yeah, I've got a pretty decent ear at doing this stuff. I'm not a golden ear, but it's useful to have that information in the data for me to back it up and say, okay, I told you I heard this thing. Now here's where it is. Or, hey, I think I heard this, but I'm not necessarily sure where it is, but I think this is where it is in the data. And then you can kind of go and look at it. You can use that to your own advantage. As far as setting the speaker up, turning it one way or another, putting it close to a wall, etc. And that's it for this review. I appreciate you watching and taking your time. I hope you learned something. If you haven't already, please consider subscribing and make sure you hit that thumbs up button. That's a big help to this channel. And I will talk to you all later. Take care. Peace.